บื่อวายโยวานออายาวัสกาบื่อวาโวเกเปวโว Ayahuasca has a reputation that is possibly unrivaled by anything else on Earth. Heralded as an unmatched healer, but also believed to bestow psychic powers upon adept shamans by many, curiosity and hopes of dramatic transformation have driven millions, everyone from college students to legends like Will Smith and Lindsay Lohan, to shell out thousands for retreats around the world. But is it real? Does it heal? Are the legendary ayahuasca spirits real? Can it really make you telepathic or clairvoyant, even temporarily? In my 30 years of study and 10 years of experience as a facilitator, the answer is unequivocally yes, but with many caveats. Proper preparation is absolutely key, and this can involve much more than observing the dieta. There is no truly standardized dieta, and I can tell you from personal experience that many tribes do not even observe this. The most important elements in my experience are dietary practices that should be observed anyway, such as avoiding artificial additives, processed foods, alcohol, and drugs. Industrial meat, for example, should not be eaten by anyone, much less a person preparing for ayahuasca. For b o b a n s a n a and other plant teachers whose influence is subtle or even potentially dangerous, as in the case of Toei and Chirik Sananga, it may be necessary to observe a very strict diet. At my retreats. Guests are given certain plants and teas daily to add in receptivity, minimize inflammation, and bring the person to emotional homeostasis. Small amounts of psilocybin are added to the teas to aid in neuroplasticity and ensure that the guests are in a fluid, receptive state. Another essential aspect of preparation is having a clear intention. There's a great deal of focus on integration, but in reality, preparation is at least as important. A basic fourfold breath pranayama practice is indispensable. The practice I recommend is to sit comfortably and inhale evenly over a count of four, retain breath for a count of four, and exhale for a count of four. Finally, hold for a count of four. Always exhale completely to the very bottom of the diaphragm. While inhaling, focus on the new imprint or program that you were trying to write, especially during the retention phase, and then allow yourself to feel whatever negative emotions are associated with this behavior or trauma as you exhale, focusing on letting go of what does not serve you. This process is extremely effective when combined with low to moderate doses of psychedelics, because the enhanced neuroplasticity of the mind is catalyzed by the inundation of the brain with oxygen, the fuel that it needs to support its efforts at building new neural pathways. The deprivation phase aids all of this by accelerating the practitioner's access to higher states of consciousness. Spending a few weeks or months developing the ability to execute this meditation well will aid you in maintaining focus and getting the most out of your retreat or private experience. It is so effective that I was able to overwrite a 20-year smoking habit in under two hours with 80 micrograms of LSD. Another essential element to maximizing investitures from ayahuasca and other psychedelic medicines is to manage expectations. When I began my training, I was a bit shocked and dismayed that the shaman would often dispute many of the healing powers that pop culture has attributed to ayahuasca. To his credit, he was not involved in commercial ayahuasca and only worked by word of mouth and charged very little for ceremonies. Because of this, he was not invested in creating hype, and so he painted a realistic picture of what ayahuasca can and cannot do for his chelas. It is important for numerous reasons. Post ayahuasca depression can be instigated by disappointment if unrealistic expectations are not met. And in the uber receptive and vulnerable state of mind that we are often in post ayahuasca, this can be devastating. The best way to mitigate this is to take personal responsibility for affecting the changes that ayahuasca may illuminate as necessary for the individual. Another aspect of this is increased susceptibility to woo. Having our worldview suddenly and drastically altered simultaneously with our perception of ourselves can leave us disoriented. Grounding practices such as meditation and other forms of breath work, and practices such as countering potential new beliefs with their opposites, can help significantly as we settle into our new identity. Going into the situation forearmed with awareness and deliberately making sure that we are not going to allow any sudden decisions to be made about, for example, the objective existence of DMT entities or ayahuasca spirits is also advisable. Believing too easily in the objective existence of these spirits, or giving too much weight to their authority, can be extremely problematic. 
While acknowledging that I have never once received harmful advice or even been given bad information from these entities, remaining objective is essential. It takes years of experience to develop the ability to discern between valid intuitions and messages from the medicine and our own wish demons or false hopes and egoic desires that we wish to perceive as prophetical. Ego inflation is a very real danger, and the preparatory phase is our chance to fortify our defenses against this. And finally, integration. Similarly to the dieta, there are as many approaches to this as there are shamans, and sadly, often people are left to their own devices after intense experiences. The reality is that each individual is different, and depending on their objectives and the qualifications of their facilitator or shaman, what is appropriate can range from nothing at all to intensive support. One blanket suggestion that I can make, however, is that post-ceremony dopamine management in the form of dietary awareness and exercise is essential. Acquiring habits that induce flow state is a best practice for integration for everyone. For my guests, I offer four weeks of free flow state lifestyle integration, which focuses on the acquisition of new skills and practices, such as singing, writing, taking up an instrument, implementing mindfulness practices, and even responsible risk-taking and other strategically implemented flow state triggers. Flow state is really just another term for experience of the transcendental, the temporary suspension of the individual consciousness that grants access to the universal mind which, in my opinion, is the real source of transformation that lies behind any type of transcendental experience. Ayahuasca and other methods turn down or even off the reducing valve that limits our perception, and during this time we are granted access to a broader experience. The parameters of our perception are expanded, and this facilitates both a wide lens view of the universe, ourselves, and our place within the universe. When approached with respect and especially with the proper guidance, the potential for healing and transformation with ayahuasca is practically limitless. Experiences of the transcendental, including parapsychological phenomena such as telepathy, precognitions that are often later confirmed, unity consciousness, and even the discovery of new talents and hidden abilities are invaluable to the development of the individual as well as the species. It is one thing to hear from sages and mystics and even physicists that all is one. It is another thing entirely to experience it firsthand. Remember, keep it sacred and good luck.